While postural assessments can be performed in great detail, the following sections address five key postural deviations that occur frequently in individuals. Deviation 1. Ankle pronation or supination and the effect on tibial and femoral rotation. Both feet should face forward in parallel or with slight 8 to 10 degrees external rotation toes pointing outward from the midline as the ankle joint lies in an oblique plane with the medial malleolus slightly anterior to the lateral malleolus. Figure 7-4. The toes should be aligned in the same direction as the feet and any excessive pronation, arch flattening, or supination, high arches at the subtaller joint should be noted. The kinetic chain. Because the body is one continuous kinetic chain, the position of the subtaller joint will impact the position of the tibia and femur. Barring structural differences in the skeletal system, e.g. tibial torsion or femoral antiversion, a pronated subtaller joint position typically forces internal rotation of the tibia and slightly less internal rotation of the femur. Figure 7-6 in table 7-4. To demonstrate this point, stand with shoes off and place the hands firmly on the fronts of the thighs. Notice what happens to the orientation of the knees and thighs when moving between pronation and supination. Additionally, notice how the calcaneus everts as the subtaller joint is pronated. Table 7-4. Subtaller joint pronation supination and the effect on the feet, tibia, and femur. Subtaller joint movement, pronation. The foot, foot movement will be eversion. The tibial or knee movement will be internal rotation. The femoral movement, internal rotation. And the view that you can see this from is a view from the front or anterior view. If the subtaller joint movement is supination, supination, the foot movement will be inversion, the tibial or knee movement will be external rotation, the femoral movement will be external rotation, and the plane of view is a view from the front or an anterior view. Subtaller joint pronation forces rotation at the knee and places additional stresses on some knee ligaments and the integrity of the joint itself. Additionally, as pronation tends to move the calcaneus into eversion, this may actually lift the outside of the heel slightly off the ground, moving the ankle into plantar flexion. In turn, this may tighten the calf muscles and potentially limit ankle dorsiflexion, but trainers should keep in mind that the opposite is also true. A tight gastrocnemius and soleus complex, also known as the tricep sure, may force calcaneal eversion in an otherwise neutral subtaller joint position. To illustrate this point, stand barefoot facing a wall with feet 36 inches or 0.9 meters away. Extend both arms in front of the body, placing the hands on the wall for support. Slowly lean forward, flexing the elbows and dorsiflexing the ankles while keeping both heels firmly pressed into the floor. Observe for any movement in the feet, e.g. appearance of the arch collapsing with calcaneal eversion. As tight gastrocnemius and solus, soleus complex or tricep sure reach the limit of their extensibility, the body may need to evert the calcaneus to allow further movement. This scenario may occur repeatedly in gait immediately prior to the push-off phase of the gas if the gastrocnemius and soleus complex or tricep sure are tight, forcing calcaneal eversion and subtaller joint pronation. Deviation two, hip adduction or adduction. In standing in and gait, hip adduction is a lateral tilt of the pelvis that elevates one hip higher than the other, also called hip hiking, which may be evident in individuals who have a limb length discrepancy. 
If a person raises the right hip, as illustrated in figure 7-8, the line of gravity following the spine tilts over toward the left, moving the right thigh closer to this line of gravity. Consequently, the right hip is identified as moving into a deduction. This position progressively lengthens and weakens the right hip abductors or abductors, which are unable to hold the hip level. Sleeping on one side can produce a similar effect as the hip abductors or abductors of the upper hip fail to hold the hip level. Table 7-5 explains hip adduction. The observation would be the right hip ad or adduction. The position would be that the right hip is elevated versus the left side. If you were to be using the plumb line static posture assessment, the hips will usually be shifted to the right, and this is viewed from the back or the posterior view. If you observe that the left hip is in adduction, you will see that the left hip is elevated versus the right side. The hips will usually be shifted to the left if you are using the plumb line alignment static posture assessment. And this view would be seen from the back or the posterior view. Deviation three, pelvic tilting anterior or posterior. Anterior tilting of the pelvis frequently occurs in individuals with tight hip flexors, which is generally associated with sedentary lifestyles where individuals spend countless hours in seated or shortened hip flexor positions. Withstanding, this shortened hip flexor pulls the pelvis into an anterior tilt. The superior anterior portion of the pelvis rotates downward and forward. As illustrated in figure 11, an anterior pelvic tilt rotates the superior anterior portion of the pelvis forward and downward, spilling water out of the front of the bucket, whereas a posterior tilt rotates the superior posterior portion of the pelvis backward and downward, spilling water out of the back of the bucket. Figure 7-12 illustrates the alignment of the anterior superior iliac spine, or ASIS, and posterior superior iliac spine, or PSIS, in neutral alignment, as well as in anterior and posterior pelvic tilts. Apply what you know. Pelvic tilt. An anterior pelvic tilt will increase lordosis in the lumbar spine, whereas a posterior pelvic tilt will reduce the amount of lordosis in the lumbar spine. To demonstrate this point, a personal trainer can stand with hands placed on hips and gently tilt his or her pelvis anteriorly, noticing the change in position and increase in muscle tension in the lumbar spine, lumbar region. Likewise, the trainer can tilt the pelvis posteriorly and notice how the lumbar spine flattens and reduces tension in the lumbar extensors. Tight or overdominant hip flexors are generally coupled with tight erector spinae muscles figure 7-13, producing an anterior pelvic tilt. While tight or overdominant rectus abdominis muscles are generally coupled with tight hamstrings, producing a posterior pelvic tilt. This coupling relationship between tight hip flexors and erector spinae is defined by Vladimir Janda as lower cross syndrome. With foot pronation and accompanying internal femoral rotation, the pelvis may tilt anteriorly to better accommodate the head of the femur. Demonstrating the point of an integrated kinetic chain whereby foot pronation can cause lumbar lordosis due to an anterior pelvic tilt. Table 7-6 lays out pelvic tilt observations. The rotation, the muscles suspected to be tight, the muscles suspected to be lengthened, and the plane of view in which you would see this. If you observe an anterior tilt, the anterior superior iliac spine or ASIS tilts downward and forward. 
The muscles that are suspected to be tight in this observation are the hip flexors and erector spinae. The muscles suspected to be lengthened will be the rectus abdominis and the hamstrings. And the plane of view that you see this in is in the sagittal plane. If you observe a posterior pelvic tilt, the ASIS or the anterior superior iliac spine tilts upward and backward. The muscles suspected to be tight in this observation are the rectus abdominis and the hamstrings. The muscles suspected to be lengthened in this observation are the hip flexors and erector spinae, and the plane of view is from the sagittal plane. Deviation number four, shoulder position and the thoracic spine. Limitations and compensations to movement at the shoulder occur frequently due to the complex nature of the shoulder girdle design and the varied movements performed at the shoulder. In chapter nine, basic shoulder movements are discussed that outline the collaborative function of the scapulothoracic region, the scapula and associated muscles attaching to them to the thorax and the glenohumeral joint to produce shoulder movements. While the glenohumeral joint is highly mobile and perhaps a less stable joint, the scapulothoracic joint is designed to offer greater stability with less mobility. However, it is important to remember that it is still that it still contributes approximately 60 degrees of movement in raising the arms overhead with the glenohumeral joint contributing the remaining 120 degrees. The scapulothoracic joint also promotes many important movements of the scapula. Collectively, however, they allow for a, a diverse range of movements in the shoulder complex. Observation of the position of the scapula in all three planes provides good insight into a client's quality of movement at the shoulders. Figure 7-15 illustrates the resting position of the scapula which can vary considerably from person to person. The vertebral or medial border of the scapula is typically positioned between the second and seventh ribs and vertically about three inches from the spinous processes, while the glenoid fossa is tilted upward five degrees and anteriorly 30 degrees to optimally articulate with the head of the humerus. The scapula the scapulae usually lie flat against the rib cage. While the scapulae should appear flat against the rib cage, their orientation depends on the size and shape of the person and the rib cage. Apply what you know. Scapular winging and scapular protraction. Personal trainers can perform a quick observational assessment to identify scapular winging and scapular protraction. While looking at the client from the posterior view, if the vertebral, medial, and or inferior angle of the scapula protrude outward, this indicates an inability of the scapular stabilizers, primarily the rhomboids and serratus anterior, to hold the scapula in place. Noticeable protrusion of the vertebral or medial border outward is termed scapular protraction, while protrusion of the inferior angle and vertebral medial border outward is termed wing scapulae. Scapular protraction can also be identified from the anterior view. If the palms face backward instead of to the sides, this generally indicates internal or medial rotation of the humerus and or scapular protraction. Table 7-7 lists key deviations of the thoracic spine and shoulders in various planes of view. Note, there is often a natural amount of shrugging inward with scapular protraction. Table 7-7 shoulder position. Your observation is that the shoulders are not level. The muscles suspected to be tight is the upper trapezius, the levator scapulae, and the rhomboids. The plane of view will be the frontal plane. Observation. You observe asymmetry to the midline. 
The muscles suspected to be tight are the lateral trunk flexors or flexed to the side. The plane of view will be the frontal plane. Your observation is protracted or forward and rounded shoulders. The muscle suspected to be tight is the serratus anterior, the anterior scapulohumeral muscles, and the upper trapezius. The plane of view that you would see this in is the sagittal plane or from the side. You observe a medially rotated humerus or you notice that the clients, the back of the client's hands are facing more towards you. The muscles suspected to be tight in this observation are the pectoralis major and the latissimus dorsi, which are the shoulder adductors, adductors, and the subscapularis. Plane of view would be the frontal plane. You observe kyphosis and a depressed chest. The muscles suspected to be tight are the shoulder adductors, the pectoralis minor, the rectus abdominis, and the internal obliques. The plane that you would view this in is in the sagittal plane. Deviation five, head position. With good posture, the earlobe should align approximately over the acromion process, but given the many awkward postures and repetitive motions of daily life, a forward head position is very common. This altered position does not tilt the head downward, but simply shifts it forward so that the earlobe appears significantly forward of the ac acromioclavicular joint. To observe the presence of this imbalance, use the sagittal view, aligning the plumb line with the AC joint, and observe its position relative to the ear, figure 7-18. A forward head position represents tightness in the cervical extensors and lengthening of the cervical flexors. To demonstrate this point, a trainer can place one thumb on his or her manubrium, or the top of the sternum, and the index finger of the same hand on the chin. Slowly slide the head forward and observe how the spacing between the fingers increases, representing the change in muscle length. An alternative option for observing forward head position is via the alignment of the cheekbone and the collarbone. With good posture, they should almost be in vertical alignment with each other. To demonstrate this point, have a client place one finger on his or her collarbone aligned under the cheek and place another finger on the cheekbone aligned under the eye, as illustrated in figure 7-19. From the sagittal plane, the trainer can observe the vertical alignment of the two fingers. Table 7-8, head position. The observation is that the head is forward, or forward head position. The muscles suspected to be tight are the cervical spine extensors, upper trapezius, and the levator scapulae. The plane of view that you would see this in is in the sagittal plane. And that concludes postural deviations. Next video will be postural assessment, check checklists, and worksheets.